My name is Pierre Salwan. I am uh, from Microsemi, now Microchip. And we're going to be talking about Secure Boot. And the, this is uh, you know, the, the platform that was the, the architecture that we actually, that our, uh, for those of you who attended Patrick Johnson's keynote, we are now, we're pretty excited about this product called Polar Fire SOC. Um, I'm supposed to be the guy warming you up for happy hour. Hopefully, it shouldn't take too much time, too much effort to warm you up. Uh, <coughs> Polar Fire SOC is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with our pr product lines, we, uh, we basically build, you know, FPGAs that are typically deployed in uh, uh, high rel applications in sp space and defense. So security is very paramount, and it's part of our DNA from many, many years back. So uh, this is a j joint paper or a small talk with my colleague, uh, Ken Irving. This is Paul Fire SOC FPGA that what Patrick Johnson actually uh, you know, showed this morning, the part of the, our announcement. And if you talk, if you, you know, to dis describe Polar Fire SOC FPGA, it's a class of actually devices, and the, the key word, the key operatives here, word, uh, words are SOC and FPGA, which is really built around a multi-core RV64 that we built with, uh, you know, our, uh, our partners at Sci-5. And uh, basically, this is a block diagram. Of course, depending on your perspective, you, you'll, if we're talking about the SOC, then we show the FPGA as a small box. But in different presentations, you see the FPGA as a bigger box. But in reality, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to talk about the, the SOC portion, which is really a full standalone SOC that's actually extensible through the F FPGA. It's really, if you think about this combination of you know, processor cores, per uh, peripherals, and the FPGA, it really it makes it really an ideal platform for heterogeneous computing, which is really the kind of like the, the, the trend these days because uh, that's what's actually re re required these, uh, you know, most of, most of the time the problems that we're trying to solve or where we're being deployed are really, you know, problems uh, or, you know, places where you need a combination of all both, where you need trying to hit a, you know, specific, you know, when a, a a balance between flexibility and functionality and throughput and power consumption and form factor. You know, high integration, really this is a, you know, one device that can actually do a, a whole lot. So as we build, and as I mentioned earlier, we actually deploy in a lot of high rel and high security systems. Security is a major concern for, a, for everybody and especially for the markets that we get, uh, you know, these, these embedded applications that are running, you know, safety critical operations or... Uh, so by the very nature of the value propositions, you know, field pro programmability, I remember FPGA is field programmable. Well, uh, if you've, uh, like, it's a really, you have to hit a right balance point between flexibility and security. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of actually write-only memories. Write-only memories are very secure, but they're not very useful. So uh, in here, we're really trying to, you know, the challenge here is to, you know, keep the programmability, keep the flexibility at the same time, uh, ensure that uh, you achieve certain level of, uh, you know, security that's actually adequate and appropriate for the uh, applications or the uh, systems that were being deployed. Secure boot, you know, why secure boot? What is secure boot? Uh, in, in reality, if you look at our, our chips, we have, you know, security comes, we have many layers of security before you actually, uh, you know, there's multiple, you know, doors and stages that you have to go through. But as the uh, methods of attacks are getting sophisticated, uh, the, the, the actual idea here ultimately is that, okay, so we, we've got this, uh, you know, your, your, your OS or your system, uh, you know, s starts with, you know, a bootloader, and uh, for the purpose of this presentation, we're gonna we're gonna refer to some of the terminology from Linux. In reality, the concept of secure boot is actually ex extensible to all kinds of platforms. But the idea is, you start, you have to start your starting point. You want to establish that you're starting from a s secure, uh, and security in this context specifically is more about trust. We're not trying to hide or keep any, any secrets. The idea here is that okay, the image that the 
that the end user has actually put in the system. The next time you actually power up, you want to ensure that the image has not been changed or has not been modified and has not been actually tampered with. So that's fundamentally what Secure was about. We're not, this is more about trust and actual authentication that whatever was programmed in the device. A lot of these de devices have the capabilities to be actually upgraded in the field and things like that. And at this, so the most important thing about the basic concept about Secure Boot is to make sure before you actually, uh, as you power up, as you boot your actually application, you want to make sure that nobody actually, uh, no malicious agent has actually tampered with the boot image because everything starts with the boot. The, what we're leveraging here is that there's already an extensive framework infrastructure for security is in the FPGAs, and that's the box that I'm showing. That's the box that we're actually calling a system controller. It's got very advanced you know, uh, features. There's a random number generator, there's a physically uncontrollable function, and there's a secure NVM. And f fundamentally, this is really the root of trust, and we can ha have a discussion offline about why this is really the, the root of trust. So as, as a first step before you actually boot the, F, uh, you know, actually before you, you vector or you jump to your reset vector of the FSBL, the system controller will basically, you know, as when you power up the device, system controller boots, <laughs> And it will actually push a zero state bootloader. You know, we'll, you can internally, we sometimes we refer to it as the factory bootloader. But basically, this is something that the root of trust would actually push uh, into the actual S S SOC. It will re release the reset, release the monitor core from resets. And it does basically runs an actual authentication algorithm. It will go and actually go through the FSBL in the boot flash. And at the end, if the uh, authentication is successful, and we can talk about the authentication in a little bit, then you transfer execution and you actually proceed, you vector to, uh, to the start of the, uh, you, you proceed with your, uh, with your boot of the OS. And if not, if it's not, it's not successful, then we basically you know, ab abort and we set a temper flag. Uh, so one thing that I'm re referring to here is that when when this boots, the FPGA is actually alive and the FPGA is, is wired that all the tamper flags go to the FPGA, so we leave it up to the user to actually you know, figure out, you know, it's up to the user to them what they want to do if, there's, if uh, the authentication was not successful. So that's the basic idea of secure boot. In the authentication framework, this is really where I, I, everything starts. There is the, the zero stage bootloader actually authenticates the FSBL image, which actually contains the actually FSBL image, and we actually t tack onto it, you know, actually metadata, if you will, and that's the actually d data structure that we have uh, shown here. That's what we refer to as a secure boot image certificate. It's a form of certificate where it has, uh, it's very important to look at the fields in there. There's the actually image address, there's the image length, and these are the actual boot vectors, you know, ultimately where you want to actually vector to. And then there is uh, also the H is the image hash based on what we're going to describe there. And then there is a, a, this whole thing is actually, you know, signed using actually elliptical curve digital signing algorithm. So uh, in, in the boot flash, and it's a pretty c compact, uh, you know, data structure. I think it's uh, probably 104 bytes or something of the sort. And uh, that's actually what actually res resides in the boot flash. So it's pretty compact and it's pr pretty efficient. So the actually authenticity of the, of the certificate is verified again by the system controller. Uh, there is a, when the de device was originally pr programmed, the, we, uh, the, a public key was actually stored in the device. And uh, where this is, uh, the, the uh, address of the certificate is actually uh, stored in the device. So at, at boot, when you run the uh, bootloader, ultimately what you do is that you go run the actually ECDSA v v verify. You, uh, you uh, basically compute and you, you have the actually public key and then ultimately you establish at least is the certificate valid or not be before you even actually uh, proceed with running the actual algorithm. So the first step is to actually authenticate that the, that the certificate at least is actually valid. So that's the, really the first step right here. In the actual authentication flow, the system controller will pull this actually data structure called the SBIC and it actually authenticates it. That's what we talked about. 
to make sure the certificate is actually valid. System controller would push the zero stage boot bootloader from ROM or our secure NVM, which is also part of the system controller. Then there's zero stage bootloader. Uh, the zero stage bootloader will basically actually recompute the actually hash. We're calling it H prime. We do a co comparison with the pre-computed hash that was actually in the certificate, which we're referring to as sbic.h. If, uh, if, if, if it compares, we transfer execution. Otherwise, we actually abort and uh, you, we halt and we set the actually time persistence up to the end user to figure out what they want. So that's really the actually process of the, actually, uh, the, the, the flow of the actual authentication. First step, again, is to, is the certificate valid? Beyond that, once you establish it, then you go run the hash again, uh, and then you actually c compare it. If it matches, everything's good, and then you, you can actually proceed. So part of what we actually did since we have the uh, you know, process was that we basically, you know, typically, you know, SHA-256 is pretty uh, common. So we ex ex experimented with a variation of SHA-512-256, which is essentially really, you know, SHA-512. Um, but it actually takes advantage of leverage 64 bit actually arithmetic that's part of the RV64. Uh, it, does has, it does have more rounds than two, but it processes twice as much data. There's actually two operations uh, that, you know, as to run this algorithm. There's a part that's called the message scheduling, and there's the hash computation, which is the accumulation. Uh, so we've ex experimented with a few options, but what we basically, the way we actually run it is that we actually run the, do the hash computation on the E51, but then we take one of the actual user cores and we basically run the message scheduling, which is reasonably, which what we actually f found out actually, it, uh, even though it's straightforward, but it, it involves you know, quite a bit of operations. And the intent here is to actually try to you know, take advantage of the fact that we have you know, these, uh, these cores. And uh, uh, basically we actually found out that the message uh, scheduling part itself, which actually involves you know, the reading and the padding and the formatting uh, to create the 1024 byte blocks, uh, you know, is quite uh, you know, compute intensive and it's kind of like you know, balances with the computation of the hash. And by actually doing this way, we were be able to achieve like you know, two to x speed up. So, which is actually pretty good. Especially keep in mind that whenever you're running these you know, uh, you know, uh, algorithms, you really don't want to take you know too much time uh, because that will you know ultimately the intent is to try to do it, uh, you know the best job you can with as uh, you know short of a, a time as as possible. So this is actually, you know, basically it's not a very c c classical way of, a, you know, uh, we build the message queue. We basically are using, you know, RV64. We actually format the, the, the blocks, the 1024 bytes. We send, put them on the queue. I think in our, uh, in this implementation, we used a 2D buffer. We used the atomic operations to keep synchronize the queue management. What we actually found is that um, uh, we, you know, part of the des de design point that we actually picked is really, you know, we basically uh, are, it's, it's tailored, the, the design point is ultimately there's no need, we're limited by, in some respects, by the speed of the uh, NVM. We experiment with multiple variations with the ar architecture and then we actually, uh, we've, you know, in terms of how we put the code you know, versus the data, whether it's all in the DTIM of the monitor core. And we actually found that we got the best res results by actually putting everything in the DTIM, which is the, actually the scratch pad memory of the monitor core. Uh, based on the actually em emulations, uh, you know, at a 600 megahertz, it was like 8.4 milliseconds for the whole 128 kilobytes. Now, not all bootloaders are actually 128 kilobytes, but basically that's the actually maximum. So, Flexible and cost-effective. This is all running, you know, standard RV64 atomic operations. No special access is required. We can actually use a different algorithm. So that's really what's attractive. It. There's no dedicated, uh, you know, crypto accelerators that are usually, uh, you know, complex and costly in terms of licensing. So we were able to actually get something that's uh, quite useful and leverages the RISC-V instruction set and the, uh, the multiple cores, and that's it. 
how to renew the uh, first stage bottle loader, FSBL. Uh, how to re 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 renew it? Renew. It's uh, a re re uh, update it? Yeah, update. Uh, so that can be done by the application itself, or you can use a, a bitstream. Uh, at that time, you have to uh, renew the hash. Of course. Yeah, so you, you generate a new, so your new bootloader would have a new certificate to go along with it. So you'd update those together. So the, the, any time you actually update the, you know, the content of the boot flash on the bootloader, you basically have to regenerate re re actually uh, the certificate, the S uh, SBIC. And this is all part of the tool framework that actually that the end user has used you know, to program it actually originally. We can, we'll be more than happy to talk about it, you know, in a little bit. But it's basically, if, if you have the, you know, if you have the mechanism, or if you're able to actually update the actually NVM, re remember that the certificate is actually stored with, with, the, uh, with, with the NVM. So if you say you, you send in a new bitstream, as part of the bitstream for the FPGA, you also get, you know, the NVM and as part of the, you know, the, sorry, the, the boot flash. And with the boot flash, you know, comes the actually certificate. So the, 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 the certificate is associated, is it really has to be recomputed for if you, you know, change the size of your bootloader, if you move the addresses, anything that changes in there, you have to recompute the, the, the actually hash and actually, uh, you know, regenerate the certificate. You mentioned that in the SHA-256-512 uh, validation, uh, you use 64-bit arithmetic. What if your particular implementation doesn't have 64-bit capabilities? Well, I mean, the, 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 the first answer would be, uh, you know, then we, if, if, you, if you use 32 bit then you run SHA-256. And because that's, that's really, I mean, it really, the 5.12.256 is, uh, is basically something that we introduced just to take advantage of it. And, uh, uh, you know, it basically runs the 5.12 and then ultimately it tr tr truncates or takes the 256 bits to, to kind of like minimize the actual storage for 256. So in other words, if it hurts, don't do it. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>